The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. What is the nature and structure of what we call reality? On last week's show, I suggested that the existence of NDEs must ultimately provoke such a question. Reportedly, there are more than 770 NDE experiences happening in the United States alone every day. With that many windows opening to the other side... And with all the individualized experiences labeled realer than real by the experiencers, what mirror does that hold to what we call the real world, in quotes, the world of life on Earth? Major explorations of what is real were made by the Wachowski Brothers film trilogy concerning the Matrix. Some have called one or more of those films the great, the greatest artistic examination of reality in that they combine Buddhist and Christian theologies with a potential power of controlling technology and the brain-surpassing power of AI, artificial intelligence. Joining me today for a discussion of the Matrix movies is my wife, Charlene, who made a study of the Matrix movies when they first came out. Charlene has a master's degree in theological studies and co-pastors with me at the Union Street Brick Church in Bangor, Maine. Charlene, welcome to NDE Radio. Hello. (laughs) Hello. Just before the show, Charlene said something that might be the basis for justifying the discussion of science fiction as theology, and vice versa, and namely that Hindu teaches that life, this life is maya, magic, appearance, illusion, and that really all differentiation is illusion, oneness being the only reality, which implies that all religions are kind of science fiction approach to explaining this world's relationship to the source. So that being said, Charlene, what's the matrix explanation for what we think is real? Um, well, the matrix doesn't, um, the matrix starts with the idea of the idea of a construct. And he used the, um, Baudelaire book, Simulacra and Simulacrum, which makes the point that mostly the world that we live in is a human construct, that it's uh, based on, um, like, what the meaning of words are. And he gives two examples. One is that uh, there is what they, like they quote in the movie, a desert of the real, which is there is a, he does have a base reality. He's a secularist. But over that, overlay is a social construct and its epitome would be let's say something like Disney World where things become even realer than real and meet all of the expectations of what you think reality is and heightens it and makes you feel even more tantalized and um, gives you feeds you back which I think like you once said it feeds you back what you believe to be real so it gives you everything that you want The ultimate thing about this is, and this is why Disney World is a good metaphor for a matrix, is that it's a total world of control. Underneath the ground are tunnels and people and machines, by the way, running everything. They have, their whole policy is, how do we diffuse, how do we control, how do we manipulate? So they figured out ways to have people stand in line for two hours and not be troubled by it. They have figured out all kinds of ways to meet your needs and still make lots of money. And that's the construct. It's what, it, for, for Disney, it's making money. And um, Baudelaire also uses the capitalist system to explain this. That in reality, you do need to eat. In reality, there's hunting and gathering. But in a human construct, as we build social order, we then decide, well, I need to make more money, the greedy become more greedy, you come up with systems, and the systems really have no basis in the reality, but um, we make them real by giving them rules. We make them real by saying there are controls. So you put somebody like uh, Martha Stewart in jail for breaking a a law, like lying to the FBI, to prove that capitalism (laughs) really has rules. 
But it has no rules. It's obvious it doesn't. We pretend that it does. And that's, um, that's the uh, method of control. And in one of the books that uh, the Wachowskis used as their source, which was called The Invisibles, in one of the little blur- blurbs that describes the, um, what it's about is a timeless battle between the forces of psychic liberation and their dark counterparts, sleazy insectoid agents of control and repression. Basically, it's about everything. And so the, the movies are the idea that um, society, you know, it's sort of a, an adolescent thing, too, that, you know, you're under the control of um, authority, and authority is always evil. But in the case of um, the uh, Matrix, it wasn't always evil, because they also then take on the Gnostic religious view of reality, which is that the reality that we see, the physical matter that we see, is a low energy manifestation of the energy that comes down from heaven. But it's low, and it's it's not. Uh, it's like what the agent describes. It's sort of com- it, it controls your mind. You know, it keeps your mind down. It keep, reduces your freedoms. For the guys that the it, the programs that are in the matrix, they feel that the human body and the and the physical only holds them back. And this is the way sort of the Gnostics felt. So they believe that that world was created by Yahweh, the Old Testament God Yahweh, who was the child of Sophia and the head god so of Theos. So um, in the Matrix, Sophia becomes the oracle, the one who speaks for God, the one who tells you what's going to happen. But in the end, we find out she doesn't really know what's going to happen either. <laughs> but <Right. laughs> um, that, that, but she is, she is the wise one that everyone goes to, and she's the one. And um, so you have in the Matrix, for Yahweh, you have the character they called the architect. And the architect is all about creating order, keeping the real in status quo by control. How do you keep is that? Is that your Old running? Testament God? Is that your Yahweh? Yeah, Yahweh. Yeah. Okay. So how do you keep control? The um, oracle, and this is the interesting part. Somehow the AI developed an intuitive program, and it's not so odd in that we know that Google Translate program in our real world, created its own language to enhance its ability to translate. Mm. So it also, these uh, programs now know how to play games. They know how to encrypt their own programming. So it's very possible that you could have what's called a fuzzy logic program. You could have some kind of an intuitive program. So over time, because this has happened, the war between the humans and the machines have been going on a long time, and the machines now have come to a state where they have um, these intuitive programs. And they're also experiencing, because of the repeated um, interaction with the humans who they have enslaved, by that, by constantly replaying and replaying, which is samsara, which you talked about the Hindu uh, mm-hmm. illusion, the maya, that they would constantly replay. And the movie keeps referring to pi, the beginning and the ending, the circle, that they're... Every, but that point is always the point of the beginning and the ending. And this is so you were in this state of constant because what happened was they couldn't keep control of people without creating a story that allowed them to escape the control or appeared to escape the control. In other words, give them choice. Human beings needed to make choice. And so this intuitive program came up with a way to control choice. And um, this is exactly what Disney World does. It, it see, it, everything always appears to be giving you choices, but in the end, you know, you're always going to make the choice that suits them to make more money, right? <laughs> so, right. Right. So, um, uh, so, so they come up with a program, which is, and this is where the Wachowskis get into also the whole Gnostic Christian story. They come up with a story of a messiah that people, that who he awakens, and he becomes awake, and he awakens, and what he is is a supreme hacker in this made-up machine AI world, which they call the Matrix, which means the mother. And he he then um, totally, uh, um, the story then is used to uh, control those people that can't stay asleep in the world that's in the matrix. Now, remember, people are dreaming 
in this matrix world. And the, it's a little hard to understand, just discussing this, but um, to understand that humans now are being grown and their dream states and who they are are programs in a matrix. They have right. human memories. They have human emotions. They have human qualities. But basically their personality is being programmed and they're living it out in the matrix. So well, these are all to, programs. just to explain to the one person in a thousand who hasn't seen the movie, uh, the, the premise is that the humans are grown in pods and uh, that the machines, the artificial intelligence is drawing off, well, they said battery power, but actually the Wachowskis wanted to make it um, uh, neur- neurological power, right? Right, uh, right. And so, so you have all these humans that are dreaming they are living in the world of 1999. For 80, 1980s is what they had. Okay. Mm-hmm. But in, but in fact, they're all in pods and they're, and they're, they're being manipulated totally by, by the artificial intelligence machines. Right. And we don't have to worry about the science of this too much, whether it's bad no, or not. No. Because the idea, and this is sort of where it's sort of hard sometimes to follow <laughs> all the threads. But um, the humans created the machines, and then they ended up mistreating the machines. They sort of enslaved, they treated them as slaves, and ended up to the point where when the machines started to develop more independence and, a, and their AI evolved, they took on sensors of personality, and eventually one human killed one of her working robots, this machine, and it caused a revolt among the machines. So then this is started, in the Animatrix? This is in the Animatrix, the, the pre-story, and it starts okay. a war, and this war has been going on for centuries. We don't really, I don't really say how long, they just said you don't know how long this has been going on. And mm. so the machines, then they go to war, and the machines have going to this island where they have their armies and the humans fight, and it's like this endless war, uh, which the humans seem to be sort of losing, so they decided to scorch the sky which means that they decided to get rid of sunlight so that the machines couldn't use solar power. Which is also a, a, a symbol of the light. Too. Light, right, right. And um, they use that symbol a lot. And mm. so um, they, uh, uh, and so in the scorched world, I Kristen, nothing can really live on Earth anymore. And that's where you get, and that's what's interesting about it, because then you're at the desert of the real. So the reality there is that there is nothing. They've, they've sort of killed everything. And now you're going to get the constructs again. You're going to get the world where the freed humans that are following the Messiah go and live, which is called Zion. And that's based also, by the way, on machines that run it for them and, again, mm-hmm. control. And they and you have then the uh, machine world that is devising this matrix to enslave people. But the interesting thing is that the machines were created. Their god is the human. Their creator is the human. But now they have their own god, which they, which the Wachowskis call the Deus Ex Machina, the god out of the machine. And in the end, the god out of the machine, along with Neo, who was their original god and is now the savior of mankind, they end up merging together and delete a virus that's going to kill the Matrix and all, which means kill all of humanity and the machine world. So they make a deal, and after centuries and centuries and centuries, there is a peace. That right. was devised by this wisdom character, this intuitive program called the Oracle. Because what the movie basically says is, and this is sort of what we're learning from science, in a way, that, first of all, there are no decisions we make really consciously. All decisions are pre-conscious, and we've already made them before we're conscious of them. That's one thing. Then there's also the Augustan idea that you can never live in the present. You're always living in the past because you're always processing information after the fact, right? So you have that. And then um, you have this idea, which the movie presents, is that everything is determined by, if, if in our world we'd say, you know, your DNA, your upbringing. In other words, do we really have choice? Is there really choice or is everything that we do, since our decisions are even unconsciously made, is there choice? And so what um, the characters in the Matrix, a lot of them say is, no, there is no choice. And not only that, you've already made all the choices you're going to make before you're even in the Matrix or in the world. And all you're here to do is to figure out why are you making that choice? In other words, getting to know who you are. That was the point. But in of... Um, and then this is what we say about uh, can we really make 
free choices. In a world where we are totally conditioned by our environment, are we? is there anything that makes us a free agent? One of now, the characters in The Matrix says, um, we were born slaves. I can't remember who, whether that was Smith or whether that was uh, one of the uh, good guys, but... Remember that line, but that, yeah, um, yes, because the the machines the, the machines are programmed too. They're enslaved uh, by their programming, and that what they're trying to, what they're saying is basically humans and machines are not that different in the Matrix. And the mm-hmm. Agent Smith is experiencing the same thing, the same what they call the anomaly, which is the desire to make choices and to escape the reality you're in. Agent Smith does that even before. Uh, we can't get into the whole complexity of him mixing with Neo and becoming the virus within the machine, but he he becomes unified with this idea of making choice. Now, the dichotomy is not, in the end, about uh, choice, because when he finally Neo learns the truth, that he's never made a free decision in his life, he's been totally controlled by the Oracle and the Architect, His the whole story, the whole religious story is made up to control him, he opts then, he has a choice. He can save 23 members of mankind in Zion to start over the whole storyline and mm-hmm. all of the people alive in the Matrix. Or if he chooses not to do that, and, uh, and instead in his case, he has fallen in love with Trinity, who is the symbol for God. She even says it once. He says, oh, God, and she said yes <laughs> when he was talking yes. about something. Um, <laughs> He falls, so he has this mis, what he has is a mystical union. And this mystical union is the point of the whole movie, which is love. And what the movie says, and which the, and all religions teach, in, in Buddhism it's called compassion or whatever, in, 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 um, Christianity it's called agape. What, what love does is it breaks the control. It breaks even the sense of choice because love is not a choice. As the oracle says to him, it's just something you can't, you don't make a cho- choice to love. And um, in in this case, of course, some people will say, yes, you can manipulate your mind into loving. But anyway, we won't go there. So this kind of love, this mystical kind of love, is not something you make a choice to do. And Neo is the first messiah cycle and there have been six cycles they've repeated the story over and over again it'd be like jesus being taken to the cross killed and then the world is restored again for a while going back to the beginning and then it goes again and again and again so everybody lives like the same i don't know several decades in the 1980s and you know 70s and 80s but in any case um he now has broken with this because he has opted to let everything die just so that he can save the one being that he loves, or to be unified with God. So there's this mystical union. And he, in that moment, not only re- he restores the God that he loves, who is dying. So you have this idea of this mystical, um, existent God, who uh, the construct has killed, but now through this love, this ju- union between the two of them, they, they now come to life, and what you get is a new reality. And in this new reality, then you get the third movie, which is that finally Neo, um, he he realizes that he is the answer, the pie, the beginning and the ending. And the only way to get rid of his opposite, who is chaos and hate, by the way, Agent Smith, the only way to get rid of that is to allow himself to be absorbed by it, to die in it, and then to be transformed and deleted by the machine god. So this is that's the idea of the resurrection, that the only way that we're going to save the world is if we die to it, and then we can be resurrected new. And that's the thing that happens at the end of the movie, when Neo dies and is reloaded into the source, um, now things have changed. So a world that had been previously only had green shades now has rainbows and pinks and sunrises and creativity and programs that love each other. So is this mystery, this mysterious element they call love is this beyond the programming because neo is is a program himself and yet he learns how to love because the uh even though he is programmed he's still human in in he's in the pod in a human and the humans have have the capacity to love so if he's absorbed in the end by ai they also gain, gain right 
does that get, does that give that God the capacity to uh, yes, it love? Yes, it involves the AI, see, because that's why the matrix changes. Okay. But the AI had already started to evolve through all the iterations of the other uh, ones. Because so this is like, this is to use a Christian analogy. It's like Jesus teaching Yahweh to to be a compassionate God well, instead of a rule, rule making God. Right. It's when Philip says, "Oh, uh, to Jesus, show us the Father," and Jesus says, "Don't you know, Philip? I, if you see me, you see the Father." Now here is a compassionate, loving, forgiving, non condemning, and. Which is not not that Yahweh in the I mean Isaiah he's taking stuff from the pro, the prophets like Isaiah and um, the, the you know I am like a mother hen that wants to cuddle you and I will forgive you and and you know you you need to take care of the poor and the sick that's the God that Jesus calls from the Old Testament and the one that everybody a lot of people and the Gnostics at the turn of the century uh, you know after Christ like Marcion by 100 A.D. they had a real problem with the Jewish Yahweh God. Mm. Because he would say things like slaughter all the children and the animals if you take the land. Uh, he had a uh, because there's this idea of purification. There's an idea of um, race identity. You know all those kind of things, <laughs> tribal identity. Yes. And and even though there was still always compassion, he said always recognize the stranger among you. You know all there was always it was always it wasn't a totally negative thing. And God loved his people, but that there was always this thing of if you touch the ark, you know, 23,000 people died in one day from the ark, you know, being touched or, you know, accidentally opened or whatever. So um, there is this idea that God doesn't really seem to be trying to solve problems in the Old Testament. (laughs) Mm. He seems to be raising uh, people to just uh, punish um, Israel when they don't you know, keep the covenant, and um, so that's just, I'm, I'm just taking it, I'm not judging that or not, I'm just saying that was the point of view of the Gnostics, and it's the point of view of a lot of, you know, like, uh, people uh, in the modern church, like, if you go to the Unitarian Church or to the UCC, they would feel that way about it, too. Uh, I remember once I was at a Bible study, at a UCC Bible study, and this um, minister said, and we were reading one of the Old Testament stories, or I should say the um, Hebrew Bible, and he said, uh, this is, this is not my God. <laughs> and because in a way it's because Jesus said, wait a minute, this is what God looks like. And it was the sacrificial um, God. And that who is, who Neo is when, it's a really great scene in the Matrix when the virus infects him. He gets spread with this black goopy stuff. And mm-hmm. then the machine, he gets, the, the machine God then zaps him, deletes the programming, and it, um, it just so shows how uh, the the splinter in your mind, the sin or whatever it is that 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 we say is the problem with humanity is is it's a very good symbol of that idea and how how oh. a Messiah takes that on for us. Yeah, talk talk a little about the splinter in the mind. That's uh, such an interesting image. Well, I always thought they borrowed that from somebody else, but I never could find it. So I guess it's a Wachowski. Thing, but well, what, what, uh, that broken mirror, the the well, uh, what reminded me of it because I did, you know, I was always I did ballets and stuff, and so I studied Snow Queen because I did one of Snow Queen, and I read the original story, and in the original story, there are these trolls that make a mirror, and if you look through this mirror at at the world, the world no longer appears at all good. Everything you look at through this mirror is evil, greedy. See a matrix, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, the, that reality is sort of a matrix on how do you lo- how we look at things. Through a glass and, darkly. <laughs> through a glass, right. And so these trolls make this thing so that if you, it change, and um, they get really excited about it, and they said, oh, you know what, we're going to take it up to God and the angels, and when they, we look at them, they're going to look evil, ha, ha, ha. And they start chuckling so much about all their evilness <laughs> that it, they get carried away. And I think it even says the mirror starts to laugh, and it starts to vibrate, and in the process it shatters. And in shattering, it goes out throughout the whole earth, sometimes as small as particles of sand. But what uh, I remember reading it was slivers or splinters yes. of mirror. And what they do is they get stuck in your eye or they get stuck in your heart. And um, the whole thing of the Snow Queen is that she um, is an instrument of attracting those people who have been have these slivers and using them for her own purposes. Eventually, she, you know, and, and she is, she's like the um, death that's eating up the world, just like Smith was. Like he mm-hmm. says to Neo, the purpose of life is to end. 
and that's the Snow Queen. She's going to freeze everybody. She turns everybody to stone. And so she's picking up all the people that have the little pieces of mirror in their eyes or their hearts that will follow her. She has her own little thing. But the but love is the thing that can cure this. So when the little boy who's taken by the Snow Queen, um, who's being turned to stone and is, freeze, is frozen, and, and, it, and she uses tantalizing things like... Um, the uh, Turkish delight and those kind of things to pull people away. But he has a little sliver in his heart. And his girl, the, his best friend, this girl, travels all through the world, finally finds him. And he's there being turned to stone, freezing to death. And she comes upon him and she, her tears fall on him. And her devotion, her love has reached him. And when the tear falls on the sliver of the mirror, it dissolves and he's restored. Again, this, that's basically the story of the Matrix, too. Mm. That your your love is what restores, love is what gives new life. And then they escape. <laughs> one of the uh, one of the things that uh, we probably don't have time to talk about, but uh, the uh, normal understanding of heaven and earth are theologically, at least, are described as levels. Is it? As Paul said, he went to the third heaven, and uh, even going back to Mesopotamian religion, they talked about seven levels of heaven and seven levels of hell and uh, or earth. And um, and the other thing too is the the notion of time, because at least in the Matrix movies, it seems like uh, AI and um, and humans are both stuck in this dimension we call time. You got any thoughts uh, about that? Well, but then the whole point of the movie is that that, that time is one of the the, uh, delu- the illusions that's in the Matrix, right? Because they keep repeating it over and over again, and and um, and when when Neo realizes that and decides to end the to end it, that's when you get restored. In mm. you, when you decide that, um, the other thing, remember we talked about the different levels and what people see is that um, in the book The Invisibles that they used it their height they had an idea that it's called that glossolalia which is the speaking in tongues from the bible mm-hmm. um it's not it, it wasn't so much that people spoke in other languages in in this thing what it was is they spoke in a language that told you what you needed to hear yes it, so um it's sort of the i have uh when i did a study a little bit of the near death and i saw that in catholicism and orthodoxy it, can you fit near death into that and that and they uh, Christian blocks have no problem with it. Uh, N.T. Wright said it opens up new fields for study and everything. But in the end, are, is it like the glossolalia? Are we hearing what we need to hear? Because my whole thing is, since there is no time, we know then there, in reality, these people never really died in the sense of time-wise. You know, maybe in the body they did, but consciousness-wise, and this is the overlaying thing here, is that when you talk about love, you're talking about an over- a control, not a controlling, but a, a consciousness that we all share, and that is manifested in its most highest form in terms of love. Because once you get into virtual reality, you get into matrices, and that's the whole thing. Science, you know, science fiction now leads to physicists saying, "Oh, well, reality is is virtual." Uh, well, yes, but if it's virtual, it means it has to have something that's generating it. And the only thing that can generate it would be like Sheldrake and other people would say is consciousness. And if consciousness is not located in your mind, it's con- consciousness is something that we all share. It's outside of you that you are interpreting in through your mind. You have, in other words, you're the computer that's interpreting consciousness, and that's where the love is coming from. And that's maybe where the states of near death are. There's Charlene. That- <laughs> Unfortunately, we are out of time for today. Okay. <laughs> but we may continue this uh, again. I, I want to thank our guest, my wife, Charlene Kent, for our conversation about the matrix and the nature of reality. If you'd like to listen again to this or any of our past shows, go to our website at nderadio.org. And for more information about the work of IANS and their upcoming conference in Denver, it's coming right up now, folks. Check out that website, IANDS.org, and tune in next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, for more NDE Radio. This is Lee Whitting saying thanks for listening.